one of these crazy guys that despite eBay's continued attempts to alienate sellers and generally implement nutty policies that make absolutely no sense whatsoever, I'm one of these crazy people that likes to shop on eBay for pieces of crap and bric-a-brac that I probably don't truthfully need, but I enjoy doing it and it keeps me out of trouble, so I don't really see that it hurts anything. And so that brings me to this realistic CD1600 compact disc audio player. I've wanted to gather a few more component CD players for use with some of my stereo setups over at the Roach Palace. And so that was the idea behind getting this particular unit. Anyway, the seller advertised this as working. And I can understand when a seller really doesn't know how to operate something or doesn't understand that, you know, maybe an item is not perfect. Honest mistakes happen. But when something like this arrives in the mail and I take it out of the box and I discover that I can do that, I think there's a bit of a problem. And I contacted the seller and she said her son, who is an electrical engineer, tested it and found that it worked. Well, if that's really true, and I think I can, you know, I hate to make an accusation of dishonesty on anybody's part, but I, I would think that if it happened to break down while it was in shipping, you know, if the belt had popped off the pulley or something, I would have expected to find it in here someplace, and I didn't find it anywhere, not under the circuit board, not under the disc transport. So on this particular episode of Kitchen Table Electronics Repair, what I'm going to do is address a common mechanical problem with older CD players where the tray doesn't open or where it inappropriately freewheels when it should not do so. Now, what I'm going to use here is an assorted pack of uh, rubber bands as a replacement belt. And oftentimes when a particular subsystem isn't speed critical, for example, this thing doesn't really care how fast the disc tray closes or opens as long as the little motor has sufficient torque to do the job and responds in a reasonable enough time for the microcontroller, rubber bands as belts can work fine. They'll even work as a test in things like tape transports, but the speed is likely to be way, way off. So for things like a tape transport or a turntable or something like that, you almost need the proper belt. But for something like this or just for a quick test, you can use a cheap bag of rubber bands. I gave a dollar for those. And find out how much work you have ahead of you in terms of a repair. But to do this repair, we need to get the disc transport out of the machine so that I can take the tray out and get at the little motor that drives it in and out and see what exactly is going on here. So one of the first things you need to do before you've turned the first screw inside is to disconnect all the little electrical plugs. Now most of these will be either ribbon types that plug into spring fit sockets, in which case you shouldn't get too rambunctious with them, but you also need to be careful with the ribbon types because they can be fragile as well. And you wouldn't want to rip a whole bunch of wires out of a ribbon connector like this one because that's a good way to ruin your whole day and give you a lot more than you want to do for an afternoon. Now most devices typically have connectors that are keyed or they're only long enough to fit in the right places. But if that's not true of yours or if you're not sure you can get them back correctly, take notes and make a diagram of how they were originally plugged in. Because if you get them plugged in incorrectly, the best case is the device won't work. The unfortunate but more common consequence is that some really expensive, hard to get semiconductor devices or other components have blown up and now you have a major problem. With the transport out of the unit now and the sled fully pulled out, we can see a lot more than we could before. There's the laser diode on the pickup. There's the cabling leading to and from the laser pickup. Here's the little motor that runs the pickup around to find the various tracks and to track the CD as it's playing. And then here, of course, is the spindle motor. And all of these are pretty cheap permanent magnet DC motors because really no more than that is called for to successfully play a CD and there's a gear reduction drive on this motor to improve its precision. Better CD player designs typically use a voice coil or a magnetic rail to drive the pickup back and forth and seek very quickly and very quietly. But this is just a cheap Radio Shack CD player and so it doesn't have anything so fancy. But there's the motor on the end that runs the tray in and out. And if you look in there, and it's hard to see on the camera, but there is definitely no belt here. I'm not sure where it's gone, but it's definitely not there, and it looks like it would have had a hard time escaping from there. Now, the, in order to get the tray off, there's usually a set of stops at the end here that you have to flip out of the way or press or deactivate or, or change in some manner so that this sled can be removed 
from the rest of the transport to let you see the drive that runs in and out below. Now this is a somewhat timing sensitive application here. When you run the tray out, you need to be careful not to turn the gear train around too much under here because you may mess up the timing which is frequently interrelated with the disc clamper here. And then you'll cause yourself a world of hurt, but it's not as bad as some things because I have knocked these out of time a time or two and it was no big deal to fix it as long as I thought about what was going on and exactly when this thing needed to go up and down to properly clamp the disc in preparation for playback. Now this thing does not have a particularly nice way of freeing the disc tray. It's only got a simplistic plastic notch that fits into a matching tab. And so getting this off of here is going to be a little bit difficult. Well, I'd have to issue a partial retraction for my earlier comments because right there is belt sludge. But the moment you touch it, and I hate to do this, that's what it turns into. So there's a belt in here. I don't know how it could have disintegrated so quickly in just a hot garage. I've never seen one this badly degraded before. But there's the motor shaft, and there's the little gear. And Radio Shack did have some smarts in this design to avoid destroying this little in and out limit switch here that tells the microcontroller where the tray is. I actually had to pr spread these out a little bit and then lift the tray up at one end and pivot it up and away from the unit in kind of a folding motion like this. Otherwise, I'd have tweaked that little, that little switch right there right off of the board and I'd have had to fix that and that wouldn't have been a lot of fun. Fortunately, this little gear that was blocking the tray comes right up and off after you release this little locking tab over here. So now the thing is, find a rubber band that fits the application in mind here. I'm not sure there's one that's small enough in this particular package, but if there's not, I can always cut one apart and glue it together as a sort of redneck repair. Here's the disc tray back in place, and there is a new belt down there made from a rubber band. And this probably isn't a lasting term fix because in my bag of rubber bands, which I paid a whole dollar for, so I guess my expectations were rather higher than they should have been, but in the entire bag of rubber bands there were none that were small enough. And so at first I thought, well, you know, I'll cut one of the smallest ones down to size. And then I'll try the first approach, heating it to melt it together. But that didn't work well. In fact, the only result that had was to make it smell like someone had set fire to the Michelin Man in here. So that wasn't very good. And I thought, well, you know, then I can super glue it together. And that's not my preferred approach because over time the stresses might tear the glue joint apart as it spins around the motor shaft. But I couldn't find my super glue pen. I think some helpful person has moved it. And I don't like helpful people. So what I did is I took a rubber band of close to the right size, as close as I could get. And with the key keeper's help, we pretzeled it around one of the pulleys twice in such a way that it would end up tracking in the right direction and then we put it around the motor shaft and now it seems like it would be fine at least the tray drives the motor now when I pull it in and out by hand so I'm thinking that when I stick it back in the disc player this should be good enough for a test and then you know if the test passes I can either try to find a more appropriate rubber band package with smaller bands in it or I can just go ahead and wait until I've got the proper belt and uh, you know, place an order for the proper belt and get it in here that way. Well, let's see what happens when I put the optical and tray unit back in the player. I think it'll work. Okay, I've hooked up all the cables again, and when I turn the power on, the disc player should suck the tray back in if it's got enough tension on that belt to do so, and then the magnetic clamper should go down as though it were going to play a disc. So let's see if that really does happen. Well, that's definitely a lot better than it was. So I think I'll go get a CD and see what happens. Now, I don't recommend testing your CD player with a good CD. Use something like those old AOL CDs that used to come in the mail. But now I've got the transport screwed down enough that it'll be stable and secure. And I've got a CD in there, and I don't think this thing will damage it. But let's just see what happens here. Okay, it got focus, and it got the tracks. Interestingly enough, this is not as nice a machine as the CD2300, which predated it by a year and was the bargain basement model. So let's see if it actually plays audio. And here to do the perfect test is the Technics SA560 receiver. Someone had mentioned that when they replaced the backlight in theirs, that it got so hot it made all the crystals slowly turn on in the display. Well, this thing had its first smoke test run tonight as I listened to an old-time country music radio program for about three hours, and it never skipped a beat. 
I've still got to re-solder those front panel lights, but that can definitely be done. Anyway, let's try out this stereo, um, stereo, this CD player, which has an interesting looking display. It's actually colored not unlike a, a lime soda of some kind, or a pop, or whatever you call it in your part of the world. And it's actually backlit, it's an LCD, and it's actually been backlit by a conventional set of grain of sand light bulbs, which when they fail, it also ought to be fun to replace them. But fortunately, they're on a circuit board that's separate, so in theory, they could be removed. I think that it'll play a CD without any problems, so let's just see what happens here. That definitely ran in there okay. Now that thing off to the left, that's actually what they called a CD calendar in the 1990 or 91 Radio Shack catalog that this thing shows, shows up in, and so if you plan to listen to a song a day, I guess that could somehow help you, although in reality it's just a fancy track display subdivided into little rectangles with numbers inside them. Here we go. See if it'll track okay across the disc. Wonder if the time display works like it ought to. Yep, that seems to be okay. So far, so good. A couple of functions I'll need the remote for, but it's looking like this thing might turn out after all. Try running it back to the beginning here. Some players will loop around, but this thing's logic doesn't seem to allow that, so have to go track backwards all the way. But yeah, it seems to be working great. So there it is, all fixed up and ready for use.